the first talk will be given by Adrienne Lozano Duran. Adrienne is, is the Draper Assistant Professor at MIT in Aero and Astro. He received his PhD in Aero, Aerospace Engineering from the Technical University of Madrid in 2015, working with Javier Jimenez. From 2016 to 2020, he was a postdoctoral research fellow at CTR, that's the Center for Turbulence Research at Stanford. His research is focused on computational fluid mechanics and physics of wall turbulence. His work includes turbulence theory models by artificial intelligence, large edge simulation and high speed flows amongst others. And today, his title is Cause and Effect of Linear Mechanisms Sustaining in Wall Turbulence. So Adrian, please take it away. Thanks a lot uh, for this kind of introduction. And also thanks to everyone for joining this talk. Um, I hope that uh, you enjoy. Um, I'm gonna talk today um, about wall turbulence and the basic question I want to answer is um, how is essentially, why, why, what is sustaining turbulence? So why is turbulence alive? And that's from the title, and I'll clarify through the talk what I mean by linear mechanisms, what I mean by sustaining wall turbulence, and what I mean by cause and effect. So I'm sure that you are very familiar with uh, turbulent flow, so this talk is, is about that, and I'll give you some a very small overview on that. First, uh, before I jump into that, let me just acknowledge the, the contributors of, of this work, Marios, Navit, and Michael. Probably you are aware that you can find the full paper of this talk uh, in, <clears throat> on the web, so you can access that. I'd also like to acknowledge different <clears throat> um, uh, funding entities like NASA, ONR, ERC through a, a Madrid summer program by Javier Jimenez and also Stanford. So I am really very grateful for their, their support. So um, uh, one of the keys of why we want to understand turbulent flows is essentially the fact that we know that they are everywhere. And this is a, the a regime of the fluids that happens to, to be present in many different problems at many different scales. So you can think of from very large scale planetary problems, or it's also very relevant for atmospheric flows, external aerodynamics, usually the, these are the, all these vehicles that we are moving through the air, they, they are covered in a turbulent wanted layer. Even in bio applications, or many times just things like the, your heart pumping blood, so the typical velocities and the typical scales, they are already large enough to give you a Reynolds number that is going to result in a, in a turbulent flow. So we know that this is going across many different problems, turbulent flows. And the question that I want to, to ask here is a, a very basic one. And for that, let me use this sketch to motivate the, the, the problem and also the notation that I'm going to use. So I'm going to talk about wall turbulence, so that's why there's going to be always a wall. And the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to decompose my flow into two components. One is going to be a base flow. So this base flow is the capital U. It could depend on X and time, and later I'll clarify exactly how is this base flow defined. And then I'm going to define some fluctuation. So it is everything else that is not the base flow. And there's going to be some interaction. We can write down the equations for these two velocity fields. And we will see that depending on how we do that, we can find some energy transfer that is going to be from the base flow to the fluctuations. And also the fluctuations are going to affect back. This is a nonlinear problem. So they are going to affect back how is this base flow. So just keeping in mind this, this setup, I, at this point is very generic. So what I want to understand is this question is how is turbulence sustained? So in this particular case, turbulence means the fluctuations. So that's exactly what is characterizing this uh, turbulent flow regime is that we have a chaotic, multi-scale chaotic motion of the flow and that's essentially contained in these U prime fluctuations. So another way of asking this question to be more, uh, slightly more specific is um, how is the U prime sustained? So how, how can I sustain this U prime? And just writing down this equation for the U prime, I can look at that equation. Uh, I'm writing this in a very compact form right now. 
this is just done writing down the navier stokes equations and subtracting the equation for the base flow so i can divide this equation into two terms so the first one i'm calling a linear processes so it's a term that depends only on the base flow multiplied by this u prime and there is another term that i'm calling n is the nonlinear processes so this they, they 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 depend quadratically on the u prime this is still at this point very generic but one observation that is interesting is that if I choose this base flow in a way that the integral of the U prime over the nonlinear term in this a control volume that I want to study is zero, then the only way that I have to inject energy, this arrow here, this energy transfer from this base flow to the fluctuations. So it can only happen through this term. And now this is the connection with the, the second uh, part of, uh, of the title in my talk. The first one was sustained turbulence, and I was mentioning linear mechanisms. So that's why those come into play here. So this is a general property that will happen as long as we choose this base flow correctly. So for now, an interesting base flow, one that might be useful, is one first that is representing some large scale features of the flow. So that's the first condition. And the second condition is like it satisfies this property. In that case, that's going to simplify a lot my analysis. So then I can focus only on these linear processes. And that's good because we have a very well developed theory to understand linear processes. And it's, uh, unfortunately, it's not the same for non linear processes. Those are much more complicated. So if I can do that, that's going to be useful. So the, let me now describe uh, in particular what is going to be the setup of the problem. So my setup is going to be a minimal turbulent channel flow. So this has been done by Jimenez and Moin. This is a slight, a slight modification of that. Um, I have a wall at the bottom. And then this is the dash line, is the computational domain. There are periodic boundary conditions in all the lateral walls. And on the top, I have some free slip. And I'm going to be running, so this is just half, half a channel. It's driven by a constant pressure gradient. This arrow would imply the mean direction of the flow. And this uh, Ari tau is the Reynolds number based on the H, is the height of the channel, then the viscosity, and the U tau is the friction velocity at the wall. So this is a moderate Reynolds number, but it's already showing many of the, the physics that we are uh, interested in in turbulent flows. And this, I just wrote the navier stokes equations, but because I'm going to be talking about fluctuations and base flow, I'm already doing this decomposition uh, that I mentioned before. I have some equations for the base flow. And this is where I'm introducing my base flow. My base flow is just the average in the streamwise direction of the instantaneous velocity. So I'm going to use this nomenclature for the velocities, u, v, and w. So this capital U, I, this Lx is the length of the domain. I'm going to integrate that. Uh, it's just computing the average in X. And I'm going to keep writing the equation for the fluctuations in this compact way. This is most useful. Maybe at the very end, I will detail more ways in this L. So these are essentially the equations that I solve, and I'm going to be solving this by direct numerical simulation. So there is nothing remarkable there. Yeah, I just have the resolutions that, the resolution that you need to solve these equations. So that's, those are integrated in space and time. They are highly resolved, both scales in space and time. And the, I'm going to show you uh, an example of how this uh, will look like. So this is just one snapshot of after running this channel flow and to illustrate how the velocity looks. So the, on the left, you have this total velocity. This is an ISO contour. Uh, it's taking 0.6 of the, the maximum velocity and the shading is the distance to the wall. So darker is closer to the wall and light is farther away from the wall. So this is a typical snapshot. Sure you will get a kind of a streaky flow a flow that is elongated in the streamwise direction. And this is the decomposition that I'm following. So my base flow, in this case, this reference state that I'm going to define is doing computing the average in X. So you can see here, it has no structure in X. It's just a, this straight streak. And then the fluctuations. So these are the isocontools of the fluctuation. I'm taking the magnitude for this example of the U prime. So you see there is everything else that is around this uh, base flow. This is the disorganized structure of the flow, the fluctuations that we want to understand how the energy is transferred from this base flow to the fluctuations. And this is one component you, so you can just visualize this for the other uh, components. Um, 
And now is when I'm going to talk about, I mentioned before that I can understand how is this process of transferring energy from my base state to the fluctuations, looking at some linear operator. And actually there are different linear theories, we can call them that way, of how this self-sustaining turbulence is happening. What you see here on the left is computing the volume average turbulent kinetic energy. So I have my small channel flow and I can just integrate the energy at a given time. And that's what I'm plotting here as a function of time. And you see, this is a typical uh, structure that you get. So you get some spikes on turbulent kinetic energy, some more activity than lower activities, this kind of intermittent state. And I wanna know how this intermittent state is maintained. And as I said before, this, one, this term is in this particular case is gonna be the source of energy for the U prime. And conceptually, I can divide the mechanisms that are happening in this L in three types. This is one possibility, it might be other ways, but it is useful to think in, in this way because each individual uh, mechanism is clear or has a simple physical interpretation. So the first type of um, mechanism, I can refer to this as exponential instability in the sense that it, it is related to the unstable Aiken mode. So maybe uh, we can think of this instability, the word sometimes is referred to in another context for when you have a laminar flow and some base flow that is a solution of the navier stokes that's not the case here, but still we can think of this as an instability for the turbulent flow. And it's related to these unstable Aiken modes. Then we have transient growth. So this is different. This is related to the non-normality of this operator. And the last case is that, that I'm making also the case for this parametric instability. So it could be a combination of the previous two, but what is key here, or what is important is what matters or what is amplifying these velocities is the fact that this operator L is changing in time. So these are the three types of mechanisms that I'm gonna explore and I'll make a comment on each of them when I look at them. So, there is a very vast literature, I'm not uh, stressing that here, but there are many works, some of them like very detailed and very nice works on what are the different mechanisms that are at play. Some of them, the, their focus is not exactly this, the way I'm framing this problem, but somehow directly or indirectly, they advocate for one mechanism of the other. If you go back to the, the paper related to this talk, you will find a lengthy discussion of all the possibilities so some of them, they stress more the exponential instability, others the transient growth, others even neutral modes. Or... So what you can get from this table in a way is that uh, 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 at least many of them, they, they tend to stress a lot the exponential instability. And I'll, I'll kind of uh, stress here and mention that that, that, that seems to be so important. So let's now go to the methodology of how I'm gonna figure out um, which mechanisms of the ones that I want to understand, which ones are active actually and, and important and which are inconsequential. And this is where I link with the, the last part of the title of my talk that is cause and effect. So what do I mean by that? So what I mean by that is that I'm gonna intervene in this operator. I'm gonna actually change it. I'm gonna block some particular linear mechanism and then I'm gonna run a simulation of that modified system with that intervention and then I'm gonna see the cause and defect. So if I remove the cause of what I think is defect, then what is happening? Can I still get uh, the growth of the turbulent kinetic energy? Can I, can I sustain turbulence? So I'm doing two things here. The first one is this velocity, this base state. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm not gonna solve the equation for you, uh, the capital U, but I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is to impose this from a regular channel flow. I'm gonna run a channel flow, the one that I have shown you before. I'm gonna store in time this base flow. And then I'm gonna run a simulation with only for the fluctuations in which I am imposing this base flow. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I actually wanna test a true linear mechanism. So this term is not really uh, linear in the actual navigator stokes. I'm hiding the nonlinearity in you but I want to really truly convert this term into a linear term. And to do that, I'm gonna, yes, do that. Get this store from a simulation and impose it here. So now there is no feedback. I mentioned at the beginning before that there is a feedback between U prime and U. I wanna block that feedback. So that's the way of doing that. 
The second step is this operator I'll call that L tilde is going to be modify operator. And I'm going to consider four modifications of this operator. In the first one, I'll remove the exponential instabilities. In the second case, I'll keep that removed. And then I'm also going to block the parametric instability. And in three and four, I'm actually also going to keep this exponential and parametric remove. And I'm going to build on top of that. And I'm going to try to remove some particular type of transient growth. I'll make some comments on that later. One is going to be related to lift up. And it has to do how the base flow is changing in Y, the one normal direction. And the other one is related to what I'm calling the pushover is how the, the base flow is changing in the span wise direction. So then let's start with this first case and, let's, and you will see how this is done. So this is case one. The goal, our goal here is to have some wall turbulence without exponential instabilities of the streak. I'll use always as a reference here my equation for the fluctuations. And what we can do or what we know for a given time, this L, we can have the eigenvalue decomposition of this L uh, using this Q and the lambda. So if we look at the real part of lambda, this is where we have these eigenvalues. And some of them are negative, those are stable, we don't care much about those, and some of them are positive. Usually in this system, you have of the order of maybe five or six unstable eigenvalues. And, and what I'm showing here is a representative example of unstable, un, one unstable eigen mode for you. So this would be the most unstable eigen value. So this is the U structure that you get. It's like a patch of positive and negative velocity of alternating sign. So this is the fluctuation or, that is gonna grow because of this exponential instability. And what I can do also is this is done for a given time. So at a given time, I can do this decomposition. And then for each time, I can plot as a function of time, what is the most unstable eigen value for, this is a still a regular channel flow. I didn't modify anything yet, but I just want to visualize, visualize how unstable is this operator. And this is a fun function of time. So you see that actually roughly 90% of the time, there is an unstable eigen value here. So usually this exponential instability analysis is done when you have a base flow that is frozen in time. So that would be actually the rigorous way of doing it. And in this case, this base flow is changing in time, but still the message from this is that it's true that this base flow is changing in time, but the fact that it's always unstable, even if it's changing in time, this might suggest that there is energy coming from those exponential instabilities just a little bit every time. And that's con continually sustaining time is the, the mechanism that is sustained in this U prime. So we, we are gonna test that. So what we have to do is to just get rid of these unstable eigenvalues. So now I change L with this L tilde and to change that is to modify this lambda tilde. Uh, there are different ways of doing it. One way is just to flip the sign of the eigenvalue. Those eigenvalues that are positive, I just flip them the real part only to be negative. And you can think of this as I'm opposing the growth of those modes that are uh, unstable with a strength that is opposite of the growth that they, they try to have. So this is gonna cancel those, uh, those uh, modes. They are not gonna grow anymore. And now I'm gonna run actually that simulation with this L tilde. And what I'm showing here is more a verification of that everything was done correctly. So now I shouldn't get any unstable eigenvalues at any time. So now this is the most unsta uh, unstable eigenvalue after removing these exponential instabilities. So you see that now I have nothing that is positive. And the flow is actually sustained. This is the time evolution, the volume average of the turbulent kinetic energy. So this is just at every time computing the average kinetic energy of my, of my box of the channel. And you see that we also have this spiky structure of the flow. And what I'm showing at the bottom part, just to have a, more, a closer com comparison with the regular channel flow, is the turbulent kinetic energy. So now this is not as a function of time. What I'm doing here is averaging in time and also in X and C that are the homogeneous directions. So now this is plot as a function of the Y is the wall normal. And the dash is the regular channel where you have exponential instabilities. And the solid one uh, is the one that that you just have here, the one that we have removed that. So there is an impact actually, it's true that 
these exponential instabilities, they have an impact on the amount of turbulent kinetic energy that, that you have on the fluctuations. And that is essentially like a 20%, more or less roughly, but still it, they are not key. Like I, I don't need them. I, I can still sustain a turbulent state that it looks very realistic, even if I don't have any of those instabilities. So that would be the first conclusion for from experiment one. We actually don't need that. So let's move to now experiment two. And my starting point uh, is the, the previous system. It's a system where I don't have any exponential instability. So that's why I'm using this L tilde here. And now we want to get rid of the parametric instability. So let me just clarify a bit what I mean by that. What I mean by this is that imagine that I consider only the linear part of this equation. I can rewrite that linear part in this form where this P is just the propagator. So I can propagate a state at time T to a state to a, a later time, uh, just using the propagator. And the propagator is just the, can be approximated. So this is a way of, a uh, nice way of thinking of this as the, the product, the concatenation of different exponentials of this L changing in time. So by parametric here, I mean the amplifications that they might come from U prime because this L is changing in time. So because of this product of these Ls are changing in time, that might amplify actually. And you can think of examples where you can change the stability of a system. A classic one is the pendulum. We're just oscillating the, the, the pendulum vertically. You can change the points to be stable or unstable. So this, uh, you can also think of this as a kind of a resonance between the change in time of L and the fluctuations. So I'll, I'll just froze this in time. It's very simple to do this change. I froze this in time. And what you get here is to prevent that this is changing anymore. And this is just a reminder that what I have is a system that is stabilized. And I'm showing now the time evolution of different turbulent kinetic energies. Now this is frozen in time, my base flow, to prevent this amplification. And I, I can choose many different times to do that. And what I'm showing here is a collection of a few of them. Some of them, they decay, for example, this green, or this cyan, but others are sustained. And if I take the ensemble average of all these states that are sustained, and I plot this kinetic energy again, actually is very close to the regular channel. So a conclusion from this would be that not even the exponential instabilities I need, but if, and if I remove the time dependence of this operator, I still I get something very similar to a healthy regular channel flow. So conclusion from this, I don't need any of these mechanisms to sustain realistic turbulence. And I'll move to the last one that I'm going to explain case three and four all together because they are very related. Again, the starting point is the last step that I have. I have a system that doesn't have any exponential instability or parametric. And now I'm going to compute the, when I'm interested in the non-normality of this operator. And as I did before, let me just give you some feeling of what is this non-linear non-normality uh, doing. I can rewrite the linear part again with a propagator. So usually what we do is to use the singular value decomposition of this propagator can give us some input modes. Those are the ones, this is an example of what you would see on the left and an output mode. This is what you will see on, on the right. This, and then by the singular value, the square root, we can quantify how much is the amplification. That, so this is telling us how the flow is changing from the input mode to the output mode through some amplifications. Amplifications in this state could be of the order of 50 or 100. And as you see in this example here, what is happening is a tilting. The mean shear is tilting the flow and in that process is introducing energy into the fluctuations. So this is a key feature of the Navier-Stokes equations and we cannot remove this completely. If we remove this, then there is no Navier-Stokes anymore. So there is no doubt that transient growth is necessary. It's how we are mixing the flow. But the, the, what, what I try to answer here is, can I, can I pinpoint exactly which part of the equations or which type of transient, flow, uh, transient growth is the one that is sustaining the flow? So for that, this is my last plot uh, showing the, to evaluate these cases. Uh, what we are going to do is to only modify this U prime velocity, the equation for the U prime, and I'm introducing an, an extra decomposition here because I just want to, I want to affect this equation. I want to, my modification to be the least intrusive as possible. So I'm now decomposing my base flow into two components, the base flow that I have, and I'm subtracting a mean that is a average, this means average in homogeneous directions. 
So if I write the equation for the U prime component, these are all the different components that I get. I have two options to get rid of transient growth. One is to remove the lift up. So it's just the mixing happening in the vertical direction. And that's crossing this term. And the other case, case four is removing the pushover. It's just removing the mixing of the flow in the spanwise direction. And this is what you get if you remove the, in the lift up you can still sustain this flow. So you see that this is the kinetic energy evolving in time, but you cannot do not remove the pushover. So immediately the flow laminarizes. It takes like a couple of eddy turnover times and the flow just goes down and dies. So in this process that we have been stripping of the different mechanisms, we arrive to this last one, which is, seems to be really consequential to the sustained and turbulent flows. And the others, they also are present. They change their magnitude of the turbulent intensities, but they are not key. I mean, this is really a necessary condition to sustain the flow. So with that, this is my last uh, slide. So this is a kind of a summary of the conclusion of the question that I asked. So how is this U prime sustained? How, if I define some base state, and this U prime, that is the, actually the true and fluctuations. So I did these interventions in the system, modifying the equation for the U prime. The, and I tested these four cases. And the conclusion was that I can remove many of these linear mechanisms and the flow seems to be uh, sustained and behave similarly to healthy turbulence. But in particular, the last one, if I remove this pushover, then that really is very catastrophic for the flow and it does not sustain anymore. So I, I hope that this was interesting. I think that this is uh, the end and I hope I didn't go over time much. And this is, uh, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll be happy to answer. Thanks, thanks very much, Adrian. That's, that's a fascinating conclusion. So th this is quite an interesting conclusion in the sense that I thought it would be the other way around. I thought the lift up would be the most essential one. So I'm, I'm pretty surprised it's the pushover because of course that's the one that relies on spanwise structure and your mean profile right yeah exactly i can clarify that a bit uh, so i don't mean that the the lift up as we know is not important because the lift up is actually important for the base flow to sustain this base flow i need lift up right. but i don't need the lift up to sustain this u prime if you think about the decomposition that i have done in this yeah. particular case so if you think of lift up as how the flow is mixed in the vertical direction and you think of the usual mean velocity profile is average in time and homogeneous direction the lift up is important there you need that so yeah. but in this case i was concerned with the u prime yeah and because of the way i'm decomposing the flow it it happens that you don't need actually that vertical lift up i see by by, by imposing the u you're, you're basically yeah I don't allow the, this base flow to die. Um, so let's go to the first one. Are the results applicable to boundary layer flows as well as just channels? So my expectation would be that this is also applicable to a low, at least a low Reynolds number to blend boundary layer. If we are looking close to the wall, because this was a very low Reynolds number, is essentially what is happening, how you sustain the buffer layer. And I would expect that the buffer layer of a boundary layer is very similar. So I would say, yes. How um, are the unstable eigenvalues stabilized? So let me go back to that. This plot, this plot shows the... Right. So this show, so what I'm, what I guarantee here is that they are always below zero. Now, some of them, they tend to be closer to zero. Others are farther away. Some tests that I did was to modify how much I stabilize things. And these, the conclusions, they don't seem to change because I was also concerned that some of these values are very close to neutrality and maybe that may have an effect on the flow. Yeah. So a second experiment was that changing this by a, a hard-coded value, for example, 0.1 uh, h divided by u tau. And I just input that. And the conclusion is the same. You can still sustain the turbulence in that case. So some of them are close to zero, I would say, but I don't think that's important in this case. Yeah, so you diagonalize L tilde and then just reach inside the diagonal matrix and just change. You don't change the icon functions. Yeah, no, I don't. I only change the, the eigenvalues. Okay, so third question now, are 
in all of these simulations, the term, the nonlinear term N, was, was it playing any role or its effect was negligible? So because of the way I'm decomposing the flow, what the nonlinear term is doing is just redistributing the energy. So I don't get energy, energy from the nonlinear term, but I am redistributing energy. So in a way it is important and you also need this nonlinear term to scatter the fluctuations around. And then that, that is gonna feed back to the L prime at this L tilde. So and the nonlinear term is not adding energy to the system, but it's important in the sense that I need that to create some scatter of the fluctuations. Otherwise, this is gonna laminarize. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, so I have a quick question about the spanwise length scales in your models. Uh, so how do the spanwise length scales of the fluctuation fields change between different models and how do they compare with the length scales in the base streak field? Yeah, so if I, let me go back to the, this, when I was visualizing the flow at, 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 um, for a given snapshot. So this uh, minimal box that I have here, this is my domain, is somehow adjusted so I can fit the spanwise wavelength that I know just from numerical simulations that I need to sustain the flow. The, this wavelength that you get is actually very similar to the predictions that you will get from either using exponential instabilities or transient growth, or even parametric instability, all of them are consistent with the wavelength that you need to sustain the flow is usually close to H, one wavelength of, of, of H in this case. So in, in that regard, all the linear mechanisms in a way are, are able to identify that wavelength as important. But the question that I was trying to answer here is, even if they are able to do that, that, that doesn't mean that they are actually active in the flow. That's why I had to go through these interventions in a way to see because uh, to see which one is active because the predictions of all these linear mechanisms, all of them are reasonable in a way. So you can always justify in a way, this might be at play and this might be important. So the, this wavelength is of the order of H in all the cases, all the predictions that you get from the models. Great, thanks, that makes sense. 